All right, the November 8th meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Welcome everyone. It looks like we have a quorum. When the time comes for questions, we will ask, we will take the face-to-face -face audience first and then the online participants. Senators may use the audio feature to ask a question or they may use the chat. There will be a pause during voting to ensure we capture the online voting and the face-to-face -face audience. Our first order of business is the approval of the minutes from our October 18th Senate meeting. The October 18th Senate meeting have been distributed as an annex to our agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the meeting? Hearing no corrections, the minutes have been approved as written. Next on our agenda is a report from President Gee. Thank you. Okay, great. I apologize for not being there in person. I was looking forward to it and uh, I, I've been with the National 4-H Council um, uh, membership here and they just left and so I didn't have time to rush out. So I, I apologize for that. But anyway, thank you very much for letting me be here today. So I thought what I'd do is I would talk about uh, the letter that I sent out a few minutes ago uh, because it has, uh, I think, I hope it was somewhat self-explanatory, but if not, I will certainly be open to uh, any questions that anyone may ask. Let me just do a quick uh, 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 history here. Um, some some of you may or may not know that I am I'm writing a trilogy of books uh, for Johns Hopkins Press. Two of them have now been published. I'll get to it in just a second. The first one, of course, was the book on land grant universities and uh, and uh, my view about the future of our institutions and how important they are. The second one, which was just published uh, about two weeks ago, is, is uh, entitled uh, What's Public About Public Higher Education? And uh, I'll come back to that one in a second. And then the, uh, then the third one, which I'm working on now, is called, uh, is called The Great Reset. How do we take all the things that, that we've learned about the land-grant university, about, uh, about public higher education, how do we rethink the nature of uh, higher education. And so I have been on a number of panels and number of conversations. I was just uh, in one last week about uh, the challenges that we face and the issues that, 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 that concern me. Um, one of the groups that has uh, talked to me uh, 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 a good deal is this group that is establishing a new institution called the University of Austin. I think it's still a working title, but um, it's a group of significant uh, folks who uh, have a particular point of view about uh, about universities and what they're doing well and what they're not doing well. Um, I do not uh, subscribe to everything, but I certainly do believe that um, that universities have immense challenges and that we need to that we need to face those challenges and we need to understand those challenges and we need to uh, look at ourselves in the mirror. So this is, so, so the purpose of this book was the fact that we did tremendous amounts of, uh, of, of public surveys uh, about, uh, about this very issue. When I became a university president in 1980, uh, about, eight, about 95% of the American public felt that, that uh, universities were important, were important that, they were, that they were good. Um, and good for the public. Now, the, now the number is below fifty percent. And at the same time, I ask myself, why is that? Because I believe universities are the most important element to our democracy at the moment. We are the economic engine, we're the social and cultural engine. So why have we lost public support? Well, um, I'm not going to ask you all to read my book, but uh, it, it, it is due to a, to a number of issues. Among them. The fact that uh, we have not connected, we have been isolated, we've been arrogant, we have not, uh, we have not um, uh, done our homework in a number of different ways uh, about how we impact the public, uh, the cost of our education, the credibility that we that we have gained or lost in terms of political catechisms, all those issues. It's all it's all contained in. The University of Austin's point of view is the fact that they have a uh, that, that they believe that they want to establish a university that focuses on uh, on on free speech and free ideas. I subscribe to that. In fact, I have said on a number of occasions here at this institution that uh, the biggest the biggest issue I believe we face is fear in many ways, and the fear is the fear of, of people to speak up and speak out. Uh, to not be categorized as, uh, 
as racist or homophobic or whatever, but, but uh, that, the, that the only commonly held currency we hold as a university is that of ideas and, um, and good ideas and bad ideas, every idea, is, uh, every idea possible that we need to welcome them. It's a marketplace and the marketplace will prevail. And um, also it's about not only free speech, but it's about academic freedom. I'm exercising mine right now. And I want everyone else to exercise theirs there. So, um, so uh, I think that uh, I, I think that uh, the challenge for our university is to make certain that we are the kind of institution that is open and constructive and uh, and available to every citizen. That every is, that, that every member of our university family feels comfortable here. And um, and no matter the viewpoint, uh, no matter what uh, what what their ideas are that they do feel comfortable here. Um, and, and in my, in, in advising this other, uh, this other institution, I have made that point time and time again that I think that that is what we ought to do. Am I, uh, am I, uh, am I leaving our institution? Absolutely not. I'm fully committed to being here. Do I spend my time doing uh, that? Not very much. Do I spend most of my time, in fact, almost all of my time working on behalf of this institution, absolutely. And uh, that's what I will continue to do. But I am exercising my own, um, my own freedom and my own ideas by expressing them through my books and through my writing, which is um, that we need to be, that we need to return to the first principles, which is that we are places of ideas and we're places of talent and were places in which we, uh, in which every idea and every opportunity ought to be, uh, to be welcome and ought to be, um, ought to be open. So, saying that, I will be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. But uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, that that uh, I have that opportunity to be able to uh, talk widely about uh, the future of higher education. President Key, will you speak a little bit louder? For your audio we're having a hard time in the law school hearing you oh i'm sorry D did you not hear me you you missed a great speech we <laughs> we we heard some of it we just want to make sure that everybody's able to hear thank you okay well i can you hear me better now yes oh i am so sorry i, I really apologize but i hope you got the essence of what i was saying Ashley, did yes. I lose you? I was okay. just looking to see if we had any questions out in the audience. Okay. We're packed crowd in here, President Gee. There's like 15 of us. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, well then, uh, then, <laughs> yeah, we, we need to get back in person, don't we? I, I, uh, anyway, I apologize for not being there, but I apologize for not speaking loudly enough and you should have interrupted me. President Gee, we do have a question. Yes. Just one moment. Please. If, if they just identify themselves, I'd appreciate it, okay? Sure, this is uh, Dave Hauser from uh, Eberly College. Hey, uh, Dave. Following up on uh, your discussion of the University of Austin, can you give us some idea of what you expect the benefits to accrue to West Virginia University of your association with the, this startup university? Well, um, I think there's several benefits. First of all, I think that an opportunity to um, to uh, be uh, be part of of discussions about higher education uh, as as um, a university president myself, but also I th I think the benefits are going to come from um, from having uh, an ability to be able to uh, to partner with them on certain uh, on certain uh, opportunities if there are if, if those partnerships come I think the same way we partner with the University of uh, the, the Royal University for Women and for Chi Chinese universities um, they have a they're, they're they're thinking about a global program that I think will be important uh, they will become accredited eventually. Um, uh, you know, it's a brand new startup university. I, I noticed someone said, well, they're not accredited. Of course they're not. They're brand new. They haven't even started yet. And so, um, and then, and then from, from my point of view, the opportunity for us to have some really interesting people become um, engaged with our university who have, uh, who have um, a, a wide variety of, uh, 
uh, viewpoints. One of the one of the uh, major uh, one of the major uh, donors to the to this is also someone that I have worked very closely with about uh, giving significant uh, d uh, about making a significant contribution to our university. Now I'm not doing it as a sine qua non. Uh, but it certainly is an opportunity for us to um, to have um, have significant people engaged with us. Thank you. And then, if I might follow up uh, briefly and pivot slightly, sure. you mentioned uh, academic freedom in, in your discussion of why you wanted to associate with them. Uh, given the kerfuffle at the University of Florida, would you care to comment a bit about the West Virginia University faculty and instructors' ability to speak publicly uh, about areas that they are professionally qualified to? I think that that is absolutely essential. You know that, Dave. I think that's absolutely essential. Did you, by the way, did you hear me? Did I speak loud enough? I think. I think. Uh, I think, uh, and, and you know, and our faculty do speak, uh, I think, regularly about those kinds of things. Uh, I, I would be, I think that what Florida did, the University of Florida, by the way, I think that that was, they just shot themselves right in the proverbial foot. Questions? President Gee, we don't have any here and I'm not seeing any in the chat. Ashley, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, there's one in the Q&A. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Uh, president Gee, what does the president say to our students of color and transgender students and residents of the state who feel unsafe at WVU, knowing that the head of the university serves alongside those who would like to create a university that openly disparages discussions of race and inclusion towards transgender students? The president has said he does not necessarily agree with the viewpoints of those associated with the university, but by being associated with these individuals, he does tactically endorse their views. Oh, you know, I think that that is, uh, that's a dog whistle. I'm sorry, but that, but they don't, uh, they, they do not, uh, any, any of the folks that I've had conversation with, certainly uh, the president of St. John, they welcome, uh, 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 they, they are certainly supportive of, uh, of diversity and all of its and in all of its and in all of its, uh, in all of its uh, 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 iterations. And I think that I think the minute that you start saying that kind of thing, it, then it becomes uh, then then you know then it is a dog whistle. It is that that oh well these people are whatever you don't know, but they're not. And I can assure you, at least with my conversations. Uh, with them, um, they may hold different views, but they do. They do have another viewpoint, which is viewpoint diversity, and uh, I think that that is something we should welcome. And um, and I, for one, agree with that. Uh, you know my stand on 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 issues of of, of race and gender and uh, and and uh, equity are very clear. Uh, it does not uh, change what we are doing at our institution. And uh, it uh, clearly um, uh, provides uh, me an opportunity to learn from others also about what their views are, and I'm and I welcome that. Thank you, President Key. We have a question from Frankie Tack. She has her hand raised. Hey, Frankie. Hey, President Key. Good afternoon. Um, How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Um, good. Just wondering what your personal opinion is on a university not granting degrees and how your participation with University of Austin might affect your support of us continuing to grant degrees at WVU if, if, um, if you believe that the way to go in the future is to not grant degrees. Oh, well, I, I'm a great believer in granting of degrees. Uh, I'd, uh, I'm not certain where you got the, the notion that they weren't going to grant degrees. I hadn't, I'm, I'm not aware of that, but if, uh, uh, if that is their view, then I would tell them that that's not the, that that's not the direction they would move in. Uh, of course, I, I believe very strongly in, in recognition for people's work and granting of degrees is part of that, Frankie. So, period. Perhaps I read some. You know, but the article I, I, I read you know, indicated that you know they what? were not going to be granting degrees. I don't know. That, that was their new approach. 
I, I think they're not going to grant to maybe the kind of traditional degrees. You know, Frankie, I have a very strong view about higher education, which is the fact that we're organized the wrong way. We should be organized around ideas and, uh, and around institutes and working groups. Um, I think degree granting uh, has to be thought of uh, in a much different way. But uh, yes, we have, to, we have to have a way for us to recognize people's work um, and to give them recognition for doing so. But I, I don't understand um, how we would do that any other way than by granting some form of, uh, of, of recognition. But for us, the continuation of granting of degrees, remember what I'm saying is I don't agree with everything that they're doing. I agree that they have a very clear point of view that we should welcome and we should welcome the challenge of that point of view. President Gee, Rose Casey has her hand raised. Hey, Rose. Hi, President Gee, how are you? Great, thank you, how are you? I'm all right. Um, I have heard from a number of constituents across Eberly um, who are wondering if you could speak um, um, at a, a little, um, at greater length about your affiliation with this new institution and the um, capacity in which you'll be serving. Um, I read your uh, announcement earlier today um, and it wasn't entirely clear whether the advisory capacity is in the past tense or whether that will be ongoing. So if you could just speak a little bit more about sure. your involvement, that would be really helpful. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, well, my advisory capacity has been in the past and will probably continue in the future. It's, uh, I'm not paid to do it. Uh, you know, I advise a number of different institutions I've been advising uh, I've been, been advising uh, a couple of significant universities in this country about how they uh, reformat themselves, uh, universities that you would recognize as major American universities. And it's in that same capacity that I'm doing this. This is a different institution. And it's something that I, that, that I you know, Rose, as I've said before, I welcome, I welcome institutions with different views uh, because I think that that is the strength of American higher education. What has, been, what has been our greatest strength has been the fact that we, um, that we have large and small and public and private and Mormon and Catholic institutions. That's, that's been the fundamental strength. And the more that we can have diversity in, in, our, in our higher education system, the better off we're going to be. So, um, and, and you know, I've just been asked, I was asked you last week uh, uh, to, um, to, uh, to advise another institution, which I will do as much as I, uh, as, uh, as much as they need to have my help and as, as much time as I have. So this is just one of a number of things that I do. Remember, I've been around 41 years, almost, uh, there are 23 people out there who are presidents of universities right now and work for me. So I have a lot of folks that I talk to. So just to clarify, um, do you, because, you know, your name was featured quite prominently um, in the announcement that was um, um, publicized today. So mm -hmm. does that mean that you will be um, ex anticipating continuing to advise in a fairly significant capacity as time allows going forwards? Well, as, as time allows, I will be, I'll be advising them as I do a number of other people. And as I say, I mean, uh, they made their statement today. As I said before, I don't agree with everything, but I, I cherish the fact that someone has enough, uh, enough boldness to be able to think about a different kind of institution. And I think that's what we all should be thinking about. I want ours to be a different kind of institution. I want us to differentiate ourselves. Uh, you know, I, I, my, my, my commitment is to West Virginia University. But my commitment also is to ideas and to generate ideas uh, wherever they may be. And if other people want to come up with those ideas, then I'll welcome an opportunity to talk to them about it. OK, thank you. You're welcome. President Gee, we have another question. At what point does President Gee advising other institutions represent a conflict of interest with his responsibilities to WVU? I think uh, that's a great question. It, 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 represents a conflict um, if I am uh, being paid by them or if I am uh, um, taking away from my own responsibilities or duties here. 
um, and uh, uh, and uh, that would be that would be the only way that I would I would think about it um, in that regard. Uh, and uh, you know, I do I do on a fairly regular basis, and you know, because both of, because my books have become. Uh, very much a part of the lore of uh, administration of higher education. I get uh, I get calls almost every day to talk to a variety of people, and I do that. But nothing to take away from my own work here. And by the way, I think I think anyone who knows me knows that I devote immense amounts of trend, uh, of energy and commitment to this university. Okay, President Gee, thank you so much. Our next order of business is Provost Reed. Good, good afternoon, everyone, to our small but mighty audience in the law school and to those that are on the phone. I hope you're all having a, a great Monday. It's a beautiful fall day in Morgantown. So um, I have a fairly short report today, but um, I want to start for, first with a brief update on the COVID-19 status at the university. Things continue to look uh, good for WVU. Our caseload continues to be low. Right now we have 48 people um, in isolation, meaning they have COVID, um, and 78 people who are in quarantine and no hospitalizations. Um, cl clearly, we would like it if no one had COVID, but um, our numbers are relatively low, um, certainly compared to where they were at the beginning of the semester and certainly compared to last year. The transmission rate in West Virginia continues to be relatively high, however, um, although the overall numbers of positive cases are much lower than they were a couple of months ago. And our vaccination rate, um, in other words, people who've had at least two doses of vaccine, as, as remained steady, 81% of our students have indicated they are, have had their vaccine and 92% of faculty and staff. We continue to offer booster clinics for Pfizer and Moderna. And we offered our first Pfizer vaccination clinic last week for children five through 11. We vaccinated 550 kids last week and apparently um, it went pretty well at the rec center. Just a little bit of screaming and um, crying, but you know, not a total uh, you know, disaster. So um, I've, we've heard really positive things from the parents who were able to vaccinate their children. And we're gonna continue to offer a, a clinic this week. Um, briefly, I wanna talk about academic transformation. So um, the area that got probably the most attention just because it tends to do that at universities was our program portfolio review process in which we looked at all of our undergraduate programs and our terminal master's degree programs to look at their relative health and to make some decisions about what we wanted to continue doing and what we felt uh, we wanted to discontinue doing. Uh, we went through that process. It's very much outlined on our website. Um, we followed a, a, uh, the process very closely. We identified through that process 35 programs of concern, meaning these were programs that um, were at the bottom of the fifth quintile in some of the gold standard criteria used to evaluate programs. Um, and we ultimately recommended 15 programs for discontinuance and that, that that recommendation was approved by the Board of Governors on October 29th. We also identified 16 programs for continuance with specific action required. And we are currently, or will, will be working with those units to identify next steps. And now we are looking at programs of opportunity. And these are, uh, initially we started out with 30 plus programs um, where we saw opportunity for growth uh, based on um, enrollment trends and um, our external data in terms of what the market uh, is showing us. And so far, it looks like 18 um, units or 18 programs um, we're going to be looking at based on the program's interest in pursuing those. And um, we will be prioritizing which programs we want to ramp up immediately. And we'll be working with the deans of those colleges to determine what additional resources may be needed to expand the capacity of those programs. 
And that funding um, may come from the colleges through any savings they uh, uh, accrued through academic transformation, um, as well as being able to access some of their reserves. And then um, possibly some one-time startup funds from our office just to get that enrollment up and then to generate the tuition revenue that will help them to be sustaining, self-sustaining. And then we're looking even farther into the future at the next big opportunities. The university held its first academic innovation summit on uh, October 22nd and 23rd. It was a two day hackathon style event. It brought together faculty and staff from across the university and health sciences, as well as community expert to design novel solutions to real world challenges facing the state, the region and the nation. Faculty and staff who participated were nominated by their deans or other university leaders based on their expertise and their engagement in uh, certain focus areas that were addressed at the event. The byproduct of the novel ideas that came out of these groups, we hope could be new curricula, research projects, or outreach initiatives that cross disciplines. A panel of judges selected the top ideas that they felt were the most impactful and actionable. All the ideas, frankly, were fantastic. There were a number of faculty senators who participated in the, in, in the, uh, the hackathon. And um, the, the judges allocated one-time seed funding to those projects, should those teams want to move forward with them. The funding is coming from Health Sciences, the West Virginia State Department of Education, donor funding and provost office foundation funds. We'll have a press release that will be going out this week and it'll have more information and as well as there'll be more information on our website. And then to keep the momentum going, we plan to announce an innovation mini grants program that will be open to the entire university in January. So very excited about that. We are um, trying to help create a culture of innovation and creative problem solving in the face of, of our many challenges um, that we face in higher education. So um, this is the, the exciting part, I think, about academic transformation is what we build from here. Um, a little bit about academic restructuring, the merger between CEHS and CPASS from our perspective is going very well. The faculty and staff are coming together in working groups to focus on multiple aspects of the merger, including the new name and the new academic structure, which they have um, come up with themselves. The name of the new name of the college will be the College of Applied Human Sciences. The college will be divided into three schools, education, sports sciences, counseling, and well-being. Those will be the three schools. The merger, the name, and the new structure were all affirmed by the Board of, Government, Board of Governors on October 29th. We uh, just hired the Greenwood Asher search firm to lead the search for the new founding dean. A search committee has been formed. Um, I believe Paul Kreider is chairing that search, but he's not here on this. I believe Paul is chairing that search. And we hope to have the job posted and to begin reviewing candidates by January. We are currently working on our academic transformation priorities for this academic year. We will announce those no later than early December. I wanted to announce them today, but we've been pretty consumed with our events the past couple of weeks. Uh, but we've already indicated that our focus will likely be on um, areas such as graduate programs and tuition waivers, student success with an emphasis on looking at our undergraduate advising model, instructional efficiencies, um, the possibility of creating a hub for interdisciplinary academic programs so that we can help to eliminate barriers to, to uh, creating those kinds of programs that currently exist, and a focus on developing um, a variety of online programming for non-traditional audiences. And yes, that might include um, different types of um, academic certification that are not degrees, uh, because again, we are looking to, um, to satisfy um, audiences and to find new audiences um, in addition to our traditional audiences because of declining high school enrollments. And that is my report. Any questions? Um. <laughs> Thanks for hosting the vaccination clinic for kids. That was an excellent idea. Excellent. Um.
I think. Just a real quick one, uh, as we talk about January, are you anticipating any changes to the classroom or online environment as faculty begin to think about uh, prepping for their January classes? Are you think, you mean because of COVID? Yeah, mass changes, uh, you know, spacing changes, any, anything like that. Nothing yet, David. Um, we'll always continue to watch the, the, the statistics and see how we're doing. Um, you know, my guess is we'll be at a similar, um, you know, in-person rate as we are now, but no, no idea yet about any of the additional um, COVID restrictions that we might have to put into place. It'll depend on what happens on the ground, but thanks. Um, Asad? Yeah, Asad Dawari from Beckley campus. Um, hi Asad. Is, is, there, hi, is there any plan to, for future plan to use this academic transfer as a model to apply to other campuses? It's a very good question. Um, I, I think that um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, we will be working with our campus presidents on their approach. Um, we were really focused initially on the main campus because so much of our academic programming happens here. Um, and um, we will be working with our campus presidents on the changes that they feel um, are necessary for them to continue to evolve on those campuses. Are, are you gonna involve the faculty as well or just talking to the president? Well, that's a good question. We, we will absolutely involve the faculty. Um, it just, you know, the, the, the personality of each campus is different and the way in which that is done will vary, I'm sure, according to the campuses. We involve faculty um, through committees um, and, um, not necessarily by universal consensus, um, but I, I can't speak for what may happen in the future. I would just assume that we would engage faculty in some way um, around these decisions. Thank you. Another question. I'm sorry, is there another question? Am I missing that? Yep. Yeah, I've got a question. Okay, hi, Joe. Yep. Hey, I'm from the College of Creative Arts. Um, so I wanted to talk about academic transformation and the way that it affected CCA. Right? Sure. So it was stated that there was a campus-wide process, but more than half of the degrees reviewed were in the College of Creative Arts, despite an enrollment increase of over 10% over the last five years in the college. And more than 80% of the degrees that were initially recommended for discontinuance were in the CCA. And then finally, 11 of the 15 degrees passed by the Board of Governors for discontinuance are in the CCA. So given these facts, uh, would you comment on, you know, your perspective on the status of education in the arts and humanities at WVU? Absolutely, happy to do that. So we, we really, we looked at the data and we looked at the data um, in terms of performance and those gold standard metrics that I talked about. There was no attempt to target a particular discipline or sets of disciplines. Um, it was really looking at what the numbers told us. There are a number of programs in creative arts that are growing. Um, these happen to be programs that had very low enrollments. Um, we also know that we worked with the Dean um, in terms of what were some changes that, that the college wanted to make. And if you look, really look at those numbers, I mean, the majority of those programs in CCA were not eliminating those areas, those disciplines, we're just combining them um, so that they become a single or you know, a couple of majors that are very strong. And so um, it, if you really, really look at that list, there are just not that many programs that we recommended for outright discontinuance, including in the arts. Um, we are certainly at the university, we are extremely proud of our creative arts programs. Um, we support them and we support their growth. It's just there may be some areas that are not as strong as others, just like in other colleges. Um, but again, we just looked at the data and who fell at that bottom of the fifth quintile. Could I ask a, a follow up question, please? Sure. It's a little um, hard to hear you, Joe. So if you okay, could, I'll try to speak up. <laughs> I don't That's want to okay. sound I'm, like I'm a little hard of hearing. Pardon <laughs> me. I was wondering um, now that the first round of academic transformation is over, and knowing that like there's going to be more rounds and this process is going to continue, 
I was wondering if there were any lessons learned about how academic transformation went about and if there's going to be any changes in the way that ac academic transformation is going to go about in future rounds. Sure, sure, absolutely. So I do want to say academic transformation is a much larger umbrella than just looking at programs that may have been, you know, discontinued that we're, we're approaching this in a very wholesale um, way so that we can look at all of the ways that we can become more efficient, but also grow and, and differentiate ourselves as an institution. So we do not at this point intend to do um, this, what we call the accelerated program portfolio review um, next year um, at the undergraduate level. We, we are going to be instituting a new annual review process that will is very rigorous, but it will also engage the, the units themselves in looking at that data on an annual basis. So there aren't surprises. Um, and, um, and we are going to be looking at our PhD programs and our master's degree programs um, that are Term, I'm sorry, non-terminal, but it's, uh, you know, I don't anticipate a lot of program closures, but it will help us to identify what resources centrally we want to be able to provide to those programs. So what I would say to you, Joe, is that it's going to be a regular ongoing process of annual review um, that the units will participate in. And we'll be doing this um, not in an accelerated way unless we reach a point where we feel we need to do it again, but we're not there at this point. Hope that helps. Thank you. Hello, Scott. Hi, Marianne. I've got a quick um, data question. I just like want to make sure that I heard correctly. Um, so you were saying that the cuts were made. I'm sorry. It's really hard for me to hear you, Scott. <laughs> Okay, I'm doing my best to talk loudly. I'll try a little louder. <laughs> um, you were saying that the cuts were made because those programs fell into the bottom of the fifth quintile. So I take that that, that means that the CAs, the, the, the creative arts programs that were cut um, were being compared to other WVU programs. They weren't being compared to other arts programs. Is, so basically my question is, was this about WVU data or is this other, comparing our College of Creative Arts to other College of Creative Arts? Um, Scott, we looked at our own portfolio. So all I can tell you is, um, you know, it wasn't just because a program was small. It was because often we saw declines in enrollment, which indicates over time that there's an issue. Um, whether it's that those degrees aren't seen as being relevant anymore or whether there's not for whatever reason, the students aren't as interested in taking those degrees. So we looked at our own portfolio. Again, I just want to point out, it's a very small number of programs that we recommended for discontinuance. I know it's hurtful to those who are in those programs, but um, we, we, we were not, you know, we were not as dr draconian, I think, as some people expected that we would be, including our Board of Governors. So... Um, there's a question in the chat, and there's also a question in the Q&A. What were the other gold standards metrics beyond, uh, beside enrollment? I'm going to try to see if I remember those. Um, it was enrollment, enrollment trends, uh, first-time freshman enrollment, um, student credit hours, and what was the fifth? and graduation, uh, retention and graduation rates. And then also we, uh, just to remind everyone, we also looked at external data like jobs EQ, and then we gave the every college the opportunity to add contextual information that we may have been missing. So, you know, is this the only program like it in the state or the country? Um, you know, is there a special land grant mission that this program has? And so we took all of that data into account when we, when we made our final recommendations. I'm sorry, someone's speaking? <laughs> sorry, Scott, I can't tell who's speaking. Sorry, I didn't mean to laugh. What was the time frame used for selection? Is it possible those trends may change? We looked at 
at five year data. So the past five years, and it is possible they might change. And quite frankly, if a program, um, if they make a case for why they should restart um, or be created in a new form, we're going to be open to that. It's just we have to take a data driven approach to what we do because we have limited resources. Okay, so now do I answer that one? Okay, so that's Daniel Totsky. Um, okay, I'm reading it. Daniel says, we know that masks are some of the best tools and we have to limit the spread. I'm reading this, sorry, I can't read the whole thing. Will there continue to be short-term mask policies in the spring semester as there was this fall? Students and faculty have been incredibly confused, especially with last minute changes to the policies. Um, I can just say, you know, um, we don't have any plans yet for the spring. We intend to require masks in the classroom through the fall, and then we will see what, uh, what the situation like uh, is like, both um, at the university and in the region before we make decisions about the fall. Um, I know the policies have changed, and um, I will say that what, one of the things the university said from the outset is that we would change um, in response to, to the situation um, as it evolved. And so when, uh, you know, when it became apparent that there was widespread in the community and high hospitalizations, we, we, we instituted the masks everywhere. Um, and then when those numbers went down, we, we said that we were going to re reduce them, or, you know, only for the classroom. And so I think we've tried to be consistent in that we knew we were gonna be inconsistent um, based on the evolving situation. Any more questions? Okay, everybody, thanks a lot. All right, next we are gonna hear a presentation from Amy Kittle, the Assistant Director for Prevention and Education in the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm um, worried because I'm presenting from my office that you might not be able to hear me. So hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen with you really quickly, um, just to serve as a guide for our talk today. Um, I'm not going to be doing a training. I'm just going to be providing a really brief overview and reorient you to our office and point you in the direction of some new resources for us um, that we are providing. Um, so our office on campus frequently gets referred to as the Title IX office. Um, however, we do a lot more work than just uh, Title IX. And so really our office is concerned with the entirety of Board of Governors Rule 1.6, which is the policy that prohibits discrimination, harassment, domestic and sexual misconduct, stalking, retaliation, and improper relationships that might occur because of a protected identity. Um, and so Board of Governors Rule 1.6 applies to all WVU campus community members, which includes faculty, staff, and students. Guests and visitors are also expected to comply, but of course the ability to hold third parties accountable is limited. Um, I'd just like to orient everybody that um, our policy Board of Governors Rule 1.6 is based on several federal laws, including Title IX, that tends to be the big one that gets the most attention, um, but it's also informed by the Clery Act, um, Title VI, which is a federal law that prohibits discrimination and harassment on the basis of race, Title VII, which is a federal law that prohibits discrimination and harassment in employment settings, the ADA or the American with Disabilities Acts. Um, and as faculty members, you are considered responsible employees, which means that if somebody discloses to you, particularly a student that they are experiencing these behaviors, you're required to report to the Equity Assurance or the Title IX office. Um, and you can do that by filing a complaint online. Um, if you visit our website, which is diversity.wvu.edu in the upper right-hand corner, there's a button that says file a complaint. That's how you would do that. You also can call our office, reach out to our Title IX coordinator and director of equity assurance, James Goins Jr. directly. Um, you can visit us in person, you can write us a letter, um, all different ways to get reports to us. Uh, we get asked a ton of questions about our 
policies and procedures and information. And so we've tried to create some resources on our website to make that um, more transparent to folks. So if you go, if you were to visit our website, which is diversity.wvu.edu, and you were to find the policies and procedures button, this is what it looks like. Um, here we have um, written a brief Word document that explains the procedures for addressing behavior um, that falls under Board of Governors Rule 1.6. If you're a visual person and you don't want to read more words, um, we've created flow charts for you, um, and this is what they look like. And so you can access those and get more information. Um, and then, of course, the policies and procedures also live on our website. A lot of times, um, students aren't sure. Um, and faculty members and staff members aren't sure if they want to file a report. And so I like to remind everybody that my um, team, the prevention education team, we do have an anonymous on-call text line. It's functional 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you will either get myself or one of my team members. Um, and we can answer questions about what filing a report might look like, what the policies and procedures might look like, the difference between informal and formal resolutions, so on and so forth. And lastly, um, I do want to just, uh, you know, my title is Prevention and Education, so we do a lot of training um, and educational opportunities. We love being welcomed into classrooms and to different departments and, and unit meetings, so if you would like to. Um, on our website, you can go to, under resources and training. The first thing you'll see is something called the DEI classroom. We created the DEI classroom this semester um, because we were starting to get lots of requests for individuals wanting to participate in trainings and we have a limited bandwidth. Um, and so this is the calendar for the remainder of the semester. Anybody who's part of the WVU campus community can register for these trainings in advance. Um, we will be doing this again in the spring, so sometime in January, we'll have another list of trainings that folks can pre-register for. If you're interested in learning more about the Title IX process and what that looks like all the way from the time the university receives a complaint to a hearing or to an informal resolution, I will be giving that training on uh, November 17th at 3.30, and again, you can go to the DEI classroom and just register for that. Um, we have a lot of information and we've tried to uh, make things more accessible um, and easy for folks to see on the outside. And I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has it. I wasn't sure um, exactly what to expect or how much information to give for an overview. Amy, I'm not seeing any questions or hearing any questions. Great. Well, thank you so much. And if, again, you have a training need or request um, or would like to access some of the resources on our website, I'm happy to help you do that. Excellent. Thank you for coming, Amy. I appreciate thank it. You. Have a nice day, everybody. All right. On to my report. Just a reminder that we'll hold coffee and conversation tomorrow at 10 a.m. This is not just for Senate members, but it's open to any faculty member. Scott Critchlow, Melissa Latimer, Scott Wayne, Sarah Simey, and Talent and Culture and I are working together to create an exit interview in addition to the exit survey provided. This effort comes out of the Faculty Welfare Committee. The December meeting will include Lou Slimak on annual review and possibly instructional efficiencies. He looks very surprised and pleased. And Corey Ferris on student life initiatives. And that's the end of my report. Any questions? Next, we'll hear from Robin Hissom, the chair of the curriculum committee. Thank you. So today I have three approval items and three for information items. For approval, we have our new courses report, which is Annex 1 in our course changes report, Annex 2. And then we also have a new major in human nutrition and food that is an associate's degree at Potomac State. For information, we have a new minor in actuarial sciences and also a minor in applied mathematics. And then the third one is a minor in diversity in physical activity and sport. I'm happy to take any questions. 
Robin, we're gonna bundle Annex 1 and 2 in the new major in human nutrition and food. Are there any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving Annex 1 and the Annex 2 and the new major in human nutrition and food, please say aye, or actually everyone just raise your hand. Six. Six in person. 60. 66 total. If you would lower your hands. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay. Annex 1-2 and the new major in human nutrition and food has passed. The Jeffco committee has nothing to report. Next is the report from the teaching and assessment committee chair, Marina Galvez Peralta. Marina. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we just have um, uh, three um, items for your information. The first one is, we wanted to share the TAC commission that we are going to, uh, we are putting the effort for this year and potentially upcoming year, as well as the um, wording documentation that we are uh, posting for the early assessment teaching, uh, early semester teaching. And the last one is the um, ESEI process on how to retrieve uh, negative comments if they are um, unprofessional. I'm happy to get any questions. Marina, it looks like Olga has a question. Yes, hi. Uh, I have noticed uh, when I was reading uh, um, you this make, slide. Will you speak up? We're having a hard time hearing. Sure. Sorry. I don't know. Can you hear me now? I, yes. Yes. OK. So when I was reading TACA mission slides, I noticed that um, there was a, uh, a reference to negative evaluations uh, of students. However, in other documents, especially addressing uh, CEI comment reviews, they were uh, referred to as inappropriate comments. So I just wanted to ask for clarification about the wording um, about negative comments versus inappropriate comments and why in the mission we only talk about the negative comments. Is it just uh, an error, a ch choice of words? Thank you. Thank you for bringing that issue, Olga. I, I will revise that. Uh, the intention is not negative comments. Of course, the students can agree or disagree. It is only for those comments that are uh, offensive and attacking the person, like the instructor as a person, right? So if someone is, is attacking the gender or um, race, background, uh, ethnicity. So it is just, and, and thank you for bringing that up. I, um, maybe I, we will oversimplify, but it's just for those unprofessional comments that are attacking to the persona uh, of the, the faculty that is teaching the course. Thank you so much. I will fix that. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. Next, we'll hear from the Committee on Committees Chair, Anne-Marie Hibbert. Hey, Anne-Marie Hibbert, Chambers College. I have one approval item, Annex 6. It represents changes to three standing committees to fill vacancies. I'm happy to take any questions. Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor of Annex 6, please raise your hand. We have 62. Please lower your hands. Okay. 
Thanks. All those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, Annex 6 has passed. Next, we'll hear from our faculty representative to state government, Eloise Elliott. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, the Faculty Advisory Board met with Rob Alsop on October 21st to get a better understanding of the funding formula for higher education institutions that will be proposed by the HEPC at the upcoming legislative session. Um, Rob has agreed to join us at an upcoming meeting, so perhaps in the January meeting he'll be here to tell us more about the funding formula and what we should know about that moving forward. Um, in response to someone's question last month about the campus carry bill, Bob did, uh, Rob did say that it seems like uh, there's a good possibility there's not enough support for that to be proposed this, um, this session, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for that. Thank you. Any questions for Eloise? Okay, next is our report from our Board of Governors Rep, Stan Heilman. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, this was a report from a meeting that was held on October 29th. Um, and has been kind of referred to here a couple of times. It was a pretty busy meeting. Um, one of the first things was to get an audit report from Clifton Larson Allen on the finances of WVU and the WVU Research Corp. And in both of those situations, uh, an unmodified opinion with the highest level of assurance was given, which is a, um, which is a very good thing for WVU and, and very complimentary to the way WVU handles its finances. Uh, another thing uh, that was of interest was um, we are uh, bringing the WVU Alumni Association kind of under the WVU umbrella to kind of more streamline and, and uh, refine their mission with ours. And so uh, one of the emphases of the meeting was that, as well as the tri-board dinner that was held Thursday night, which was a joint dinner of the Alumni Association, the Board of Governors and the WVU Foundation Board. Um, <clears throat> another thing that uh, over the next few years will probably have some impact is to begin modernizing uh, some of the information technology infrastructure that underlies a lot of the processes that we uh, do here at WVU. The hope is, is to really improve uh, the way these systems work and, and to be honest with you, kind of bring them into the 21st century in some ways so that uh, things can, can work a lot more smoothly here. Uh, one of the things that's required of us uh, is to come up with a 10-year campus development plan and that is this year. So that plan uh, has been put out uh, for comment. Um, and then um, as Marianne was talking about, the board approved the discontinuation of certain programs um, and then affirmed a new name for the combination of the CEHS and CPAS colleges. And that would be, as was mentioned, the College of Applied Human Sciences. And then our next meeting will actually be held on December 17th. And so that is my report. Thanks, Stan. Any questions for Stan? Okay, thank you. Is there any new business? I'm trying to move this up. Natalie St. Corcoran, Eberly College. Um, I was hoping to get some guidance from the provost office on um, attendance. So uh, uh, I and a number of my colleagues um, have had students who've been kind of chronically absent, missing assignments um, and missing assessments. And um, uh, those students are not uh, passing their, their class um, or classes. And if this were a normal semester, uh, those students would be failing. And, um, and so I think a lot of us are sort of at a loss for what to do uh, about these students. Thanks, Natalie. Can you, can you explain a, a little more what the problem is? You didn't 
you weren't saying quarantine students, you're saying students just choosing not to come to class. I mean, not necessarily. So, um, so they could be students who've been quarantined multiple times. So for example, I have a student who's um, uh, on his third quarantine. Yeah. Um, uh, could be uh, students who uh, aren't coming um, and they may be sick. Uh, they may might not be, they're not necessarily communicating, um, but, but they're definitely MIA. Thanks, that helps a lot. Yeah, it, it's been a difficult semester for the attendance policy, quite frankly. It, it's been really hard to give a, get a balance that treats more students fairly than unfairly and more faculty fairly than unfairly. Um, I, I think that in many cases, we, we are trying as well as we can, at least the, the complaints about attendance that come through our office, to have faculty work it out with the students as best they can. We do understand with the repeated absences due to quarantine, this will be very difficult um, for many faculty to accommodate. Um, you know, we, we don't have a great way in the university to address this because students are expected to complete all the work and the learning outcomes in the class. All we can do is hope that they're able to reach those learning outcomes in some alternative fashion. Um, in some cases they will be, um, and, and in some cases it will be very difficult for them to do so. Um, and there are times when an incomplete might be in play. Um, there are in times when the student, you know, um, can withdraw up to week 13, which isn't our, probably our best solution, but it's the one that we may have to use in these cases. Um, what we can hope is that as we go forward and more and more students are vaccinated, this will be less and less of a problem. Um, quite frankly, multiple quarantines are really only happening to unvaccinated students. We don't want to discriminate against them. But on the other hand, when the complaints come to our office, we always remind students, if you're vaccinated, you most often do not have to quarantine. Um, so that's been our sort of consistent message from about week four or five on. Does that help? I mean, <laughs> I wish I had a hard answer for everyone. I do appreciate everything faculty are doing to try to accommodate these students. I know it's difficult. It, it really is. It, it's very hard to teach with students not attending class like you expect them to attend. I will say the number of complaints received by our offense is down significantly than where it was four or five weeks ago. Um, I don't know if that's an indication that things are sort of leveling out or not, but I hope it is. Um, it just it just makes for a lot of inconsistencies, you know, so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to turn to a course coordinator, you know, because I'm teaching one of those kind of large or many section Jeff courses, but um, but not not everybody has that. I mean, most folks don't, right? So, um, so I, you know, I feel like in, in some instances there's going to be consistency, but then in other instances not. But only if you have somebody you can turn to for that kind of guidance. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. Um, I think if we had a perfect solution for it, we would do it. Um, all I know is you can always have the student reach out to our office and we'll give them the best guidance we can. Um, they can email the provost vanity account if they want. Faculty members can do the same thing. These are difficult situations and quite frankly, they're often one-offs. One person, one student's circumstances don't really suit another, you know, a, a general policy. We hope that the policy, someone told me this a long time ago, we hope that the policy is okay for 90% of students then the other 10% are gonna require some sort of um, additional work to get through. Uh, Emily Murphy from CPAS. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate and um, also moving forward. So in next semester, I think that we're going to need to clearly communicate if the attendance policy is staying consistent that it is this semester because it, it has become an issue. And it's not just for the students that are quarantined, it's the students that email you two hours before class and say they're not feeling well, they don't know if they have COVID, they're gonna go get tested. And then they're MIA for two weeks and then they come back to you after those two weeks and wanna know what they've missed and how you're gonna help them make up the work that they've missed. So I will say from colleagues that I've talked to in my colleges and, and other colleges, this has been probably one of the most difficult semesters for us as faculty, just because of all the extra work we're having to put in to keep students 
kind of a, like afloat um, and we're barely keeping afloat. And so as this semester winds down and the new semester is starting, I think that we need to have a much clearer, more, much more stringent um, attendance policy for January. And, it, and, and I don't know what that is, but it, I mean, if you're not, if you're not in quarantine because of COVID, then you know, do those students get the same accommodations if they're just not feeling well? I think we've, as faculty, have tried to accommodate as best we can, but it's exhausting. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, I mean, faculty are, are one part of the equation. The other part of the equation are students. Um, you know, I know it's hard to give them the benefit of the doubt all the time, but often they're as, as worried and anxious about possibly having COVID as, as we are about having them in our classroom. In crafting the attendance policy, we were really careful to make sure we were not incentivizing them to come to class when they didn't feel well. If our goal is to make a more stringent policy. You have to realize that if students know they will be punished for not attending class through an attendance policy, they will attend class whether they're sick or not. Um, so it, you know, it, there's a balancing act here, and it, it's it's been difficult to get it just right. And I'm not saying for them to come to class, but I think that if we say if you are missing class, then it's your it's up to you to get in, in touch with the instructor within a certain amount of days, not two weeks, they haven't come. And then they would say, what have I missed? You, you know, we haven't been Zooming our classes. So, I mean, it's just, so there has to be some way of kind of rectifying that because again, I'm not, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, some of the students are anxious, but I do know some are maybe not anxious and taking advantage of it and then coming back and expecting us to, to you know, basically get them caught back up. So I am, I will give the students, you know, all the help that they need, but it's just been really tiresome this semester. And it's not just, I mean, I've been hearing this from many, many people. This semester has been worse than others, even though we hope that we're on the tail end of COVID, it's just been much more kind of exhausting. Yeah, and I appreciate that, Emily. It's a hard, it's been a hard semester on everyone, um, undoubtedly. Lisa DeBartolomeo, Everly College, not to pile on, Evan, um, but, to your point earlier, I think that you're probably hearing fewer complaints because I think more and more students have just sort of thrown up their hands and said, I give up. Um, what I'm seeing more and more in addition to people who are quarantining or people who have been exposed or people who feel sick and don't wanna to come to class so that they don't make their, their colleagues feel uncomfortable or me feel uncomfortable are people who are experiencing deep seated mental health issues and this is what really concerns me because COVID is one thing, but I'm seeing a lot of students who are just completely unable to cope. Um, and I think that attendance policies going forward need to take that much more into account. Uh, I know Caruth is doing all they can. I know all of my faculty colleagues are extending grace and mercy wherever they can, but I think it's also becoming increasingly difficult for faculty who probably also need some grace and mercy. And we're about to go into the worst time of the semester. It's not gonna get better, it's gonna get worse. Uh, I don't really have a solution for it, but I, I think it would be really helpful to have some messaging from the provost office, particularly to encourage faculty to be as flexible and as caring and as forgiving as possible, because I think a lot of folks, particularly instructors and graduate teaching assistants, look elsewhere uh, for some leadership. And I think having having that that message come from you would be really helpful to feel like they have permission to do that, as opposed to oh no, I have to be authoritative. Thanks. Lisa, I appreciate it. Um, and maybe we can pull together a group of faculty senators to talk over the attendance policy, um, you know, before spring semester starts. I, I think that's a good idea. As I said, it, it's hard to get right. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can with it. I do appreciate all the leniency that faculty are extending. I know it's a lot of extra manual work on their part. I will say that when we looked at our eight week midterm grades, they were actually a little better than they had been for a couple of years. Now, that may be because people are being more lenient. It may be just, you know, any number of factors could be involved. But we were pleasantly surprised to see that, you know, despite all the difficulties COVID presents, 
the students weren't falling off the map. Things were largely consistent, if not a tiny bit better than they had been um, a little bit previously. Did you wanna, do you have a comment, Marianne? Are you good? Thanks. Um, Lisa said you're discriminating against the vaccinated by not mandating vaccination. This quote unquote attendance policy is not a policy. You're giving special treatment to those who have chosen not to protect our community. Um, hang on, we got some more. Um, I'm trying to scroll, scroll through. As a parent of a student, they are really struggling, both mentally and physically. Anytime ours is sick, he does not attend class out of an abundance of caution. If you want a student opinion, he recently said that the students are adults who are paying to come to class and we should not treat attendance like this as high school. Coming to class leads to better grades, so students should want to attend. Um, I, Melanie, I appreciate your perspective, but before I used attendance policies, I had terrible absenteeism in class. This is a particular problem for highly interactive classes. I agree with all of this. To help address and manage my limited time, I live stream my courses and students are expected to participate even when in quarantine. Or even when in quarantine, if they don't show up, then or at least, or at least preemptively make arrangements, then they are marked absent. Um, mandatory vaccinations alleviates many of these attendance concerns. Hang on. We're getting close. When students miss my class, they miss experiences and content that is very difficult for them to make up, hard to recreate some in class experiences. That's it. Thanks, Evan. Okay, next, I need a motion to move into executive session under chapter six, article 9A, section four, subsection B7 of the Code of West Virginia to avoid premature disclosure of an honorary degree. Do I have a motion? Ashley, I move that we move to executive session. <laughs> Do I have a second? Thank you. <laughs> I have a second. Um, while we are doing some work behind the scenes, um, you will be receiving a link um, that will have the honorary degree information included in that link. If you are here um, in person, we have paper copies. And then just give us a couple of minutes to get everyone over into executive session. There's been a link distributed in the chat. Please open that link and begin reading about the three honorary degree candidates. Provost Reed is also going to share a little additional information as the committee chair. If you are not a senator, please make sure that you leave the meeting. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So um, the first time I did this, I didn't realize, but I'm the chair of the committee. <laughs> voted. So I'm the one who actually has to make a case for each of these individuals. Um, there is a committee that votes uh, that is comprised of all sorts of people, including faculty, and um, they approved all three of these uh, members to go forward uh, to be voted by the full, um, the full Senate. So just to remind everybody that um, we have three individuals who are, um, that you'll be looking at today for um, advancing uh, for honorary degree status. And uh, they include uh, Dr. Uh, Apuzo, Denise Giardina, and Jack Mar Marucci. Um, as you read through these sheets, remember that um, there are three criteria that you look at, but successful candidates have to meet at least one of those criterion, not necessarily all of them. Um, and so they are, has attained national, international pre preeminence in their field, has provided distinguished and preeminent leadership in society, has a record of extraordinary philanthropy and or support of WVU and its goals. Okay, so I'm going to read them in the order that we have them. So the first, and, and let me ask you, Ashley, remind me, do, do we vote on, do they vote on them all at the same time or they do yes, them one at a time? We have a culture 
conference link and then the people in person have a paper ballot. Okay. So we will release after we talk about everyone. Okay, so we pause after we talk about each one for any kind of questions, is that it? Yes. Okay, sounds great. All right, so the first one is Dr. Michael Apuzo. Um, you may recall him, he was uh, nominated two years ago, so in a fall of 2019. And um, the neurosciences program has resubmitted his application and they, they did add some information that I know uh, was missing the first time. So um, you have your description. I'll just, I'll just read a little bit, uh, a little bit of the um, summary, uh, paraphrasing a little bit. Um, Dr. Puzo is a world renowned re a neurosurgeon whose innovations in brain surgery have advanced the field of neurosurgery in multiple ways. He is often considered to be one of the principal fathers of, or parents, I should say, of modern neurosurgery. He is also a hugely prolific scholar, having authored several books and texts that are considered classics in the field, along with 750 publications. He has served on 25 editorial boards and for 18 years served as editor-in-chief for the flagship journal in his field, Neurosurgery. He has received multiple national and international awards and prizes and has received several honorary doctorate degrees, including one from Ohio State University. He's based in California and holds several appointments at the University of Southern California. He has strong ties. Okay, so this is, I think, an area that was a question that came up two, two years ago. Um, again, he doesn't necessarily have to have an affiliation with WVU, but there was a question about whether he did. And so um, in the letter um, provided by Dr. Ali Rizai and Dr. Randy Nelson, who is chair of the WVU Neurosciences Program, um, you know, they, they clarified his strong ties to the RNI Center, um, but also, um, you know, I spoke at length with Dr. Nelson uh, to clarify even more than was in the letter. He said that um, Dr. Apuzo was really the co-architect of the Blanchett Rockefeller Neurosciences Institution, and that he helped WVU envision it not just as a research center on the Hill, but as a modern center that combines cutting edge research with first rate practice that has garnered enormous positive press for WVU. He actually helped to map out the proposal and design of the center. He is currently a paid consultant. He works between 15 to 20 hours a week on RNI business, including identifying top residents and potential faculty for open positions. Um, Dr. Nelson says we would never have been able to attract the high quality talent that we have been able to if Dr. Apuzo hadn't recruited and recommended those individuals. He also regularly engages with the leadership of RNI, um, faculty, chairs, and residents, providing feedback and mentorship on their research and practice. He's been to Morgantown multiple times, um, conducted ground rounds, et cetera, and he talks on a weekly basis or to a biweekly basis with Dr. Rezai, Dr. Randy Nelson, and others. He's also helped RNI secure the services of top grant writers, graphic artists, and experimental design experts to help RNI surgeons prepare competitive grant proposals. Um, Dr. Nelson says he believes that the current success of RNI and the neurosciences program um, really can be attributed uh, largely to Dr. Apuzo's engagement with the RNI. And, um, and, and Dr. Nelson believes that that, that program will, it, uh, will achieve a national ranking in the next year or two. Um, and so that is my summary of Dr. Apuzo. Any questions, comments? Okay. What does it say? I don't, no, no questions. It doesn't look like that. Okay. All right. That is Dr. Apuzo. Um, second candidate, or just in the order I have it in, is Denise Giardina. Um, she was born in Bluefield, West Virginia, and she is considered to be one of the most important and well-respected West Virginia writers living today. She received her BA in history from West Virginia Westland College. She pursued graduate work at Marshall and she received her Master's of Divinity from the Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria, Virginia. In addition to being a writer, she is an ordained deacon in the Episcopalian Church. 
Uh, Ms. Giardina has written a number of books, including two of her most well-known books, Storming Heaven and The Unquiet Earth, which are novels focused on the West Virginia coal mining industry and its very complicated history. She's received multiple awards for her work, including the American Book Award for The Unquiet Earth, the W.D. Weatherford Award for Storming Heaven, and for Saints and Villains, the Boston Book Review Fiction Prize, the Fisk Fiction Prize, and the International Dublin Literary Award. She has appeared in the PBS special, The Mining Wars, and the documentary Appalachia, A History of the Mountains and People, narrated by Sissy Spacek. She also served as, a, as an historical interpreter for the West Virginia Humanities Council, the History Alive program, and she continues to give talks around the state about writing, Appalachia, and West Virginia coal mining. Um, she became the first statewide nominee for the Mountain Party in 2000 general election, and she is considered by some to be a folk hero for her anti-mountaintop removal platform. She's an activist for environmental and min uh, minors' rights issues, and while she has not contributed financially to the university, her books have been used in fiction writing courses and in Appalachia history courses at WVU for at least two decades. Questions, comments about Denise Giardina? Okie doke. And then last but not least, Jack Marucci. Jack Marucci is a 1986 grad, six graduate of WVU and he is currently entering his 24th season as director of athletic training at Louisiana State University where he oversees the athletic training operation for 21 varsity sports. He also serves as the director of performance innovation at LSU, a position that was created this year just for him, which puts him in charge of the university's sports sciences teams. Formerly, he served as an assistant athletic trainer at Florida State and graduate assistant trainer at Alabama. He has worked for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Cleveland Browns. Marucci studies and has developed novel solutions to improving athletic performance using qualitative data, observation of athletes in the field, and cutting edge technology such as eye tracking. He's a highly respected trainer whose passion for research and development has produced innovations in sports medicine and led to practices that coaches use to improve their players' performances. But he may best be known for the business that he created off the playing field. He is an inventor, inventor and entrepreneur who founded the Marucci Bat Company, which sold for $200 million in 2020. Um, the company was originally started in a workshop in his own backyard where he specially designed a better bat for his son to play baseball. Today, his bats are the most used bats in Major League Baseball, and Marucci Sports, as it's now called, is the number one bat manufacturer in the world. His bats now include a line of aluminum bats for both baseball and softball. Jack Marucci is always looking to make improvements to athletic performance. He is described as being highly creative and a person of strong character. In 2019, he was inducted into the CPAS Hall of Fame. Um, he also, I spoke to the Dean, Dean Watson, and he said that, that uh, Jack has a strong relationship with the athletic training program here. He has hired a lot of WVU grads to work for him. He is always willing to meet with students to offer career advice and to make connections for them. And he has come back several times to talk to athletic training and sports management students. And that is my summary of Jack Marucci. Any questions? Any comments? I'm finished. All right. So there's been a link placed for the ballot in your chat. Please take a moment and complete this link. Do I have a motion to move out of executive session? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? <laughs> Do I have a second? All right, thank you.
I, it is, it's so cold in here. Just a few minutes to vote. We will not be leaving the ballot open just as if we would be in person and you would be leaving the hall. So for like the next 15 minutes till five o'clock, we'll leave the ballot open. We're adjourned.